Good day to you, Jason here, Birchfield Family Farm, Oxford, Ohio. Grass-fed Red Devon cattle, St. Croix sheep and chickens in a rotational grazing system here. Under five acres that we rotate on. Our farm's just under 60 acres though, so we, uh, we rent some ground. I have a good word for you today. This comes from John 6. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Our low to mid 50s. Uh, pretty stiff wind, 10 to 15 mile an hour here, and, and some rain. It's been uh, just drizzling uh, all day, which we can use the moisture, but uh, makes for uh, makes for a chilly day here. Uh, Rams back in here. You can see there's uh, Mama's two raised bed uh, gardens there. We've got some garlic we need to put out uh, at the end of the month here. Put garlic out right around uh, right around Halloween. Put the Rams in there. We had some cover crops on those, and the Rams have done. Uh, Pretty good job of cleaning those up. Okay, so we had the cattle back in here uh, with these guys just in this little section here. Boy, are they looking great or what? Uh, these are some of our best looking rams that we've had uh, on the farm here. These are our two main two main dudes here for uh, breeding this year. And uh, you know, this is interesting. We sowed a little bit of daikon radish over here. And uh, look at what the cattle and the, the sheep have done. Look at the size of that, by the way. Uh, pretty cool, uh, but yeah, they've been they've been gnawing on this. Look at that. <laughs> Have at it, boys. Looks like the daikon is a uh, a grazing fit there. So, in regards to our Saint Croix sheep, the rams will be going in here at the uh, really at mid November is when we like to put rams in with ewes. And then uh, that gives us a lamb crop that drops right about mid-April, right about tax day lambs. Uh, found that around here, uh, you know, we really try and lamb right, right as that green grass is coming on. And uh, then that gives uh, mama some really good nutrition, really good milk, uh, since we are all grass-fed on cattle and sheep. Uh, these guys were out here with cattle. Oh man, they're ready to go, uh, ready to move. Uh, let's get them on the move and we'll we'll walk and talk. Coming from paddock six onto paddock seven. Looks like he's been in the dirt there. Daisy looking good. Mr. Big. Ruman, Ruman Phil's looking good on these guys. Emma, Petey, Joy. Oh, come on, big boy. Come on through here. Okay, we'll have to chase that one there. So uh, I got Sam coming over on the mower here. We're gonna move this mineral. I wanna chat just a bit about that. But looking at this pasture here, I grazed this a little closer than usual. We left them for two days instead of one. But uh, doing that with some intention here, I want to spread a mix of cereal rye and red hard turkey wheat on here uh, i got about 20 pounds 10 pounds of rye 10 pounds of wheat winter wheat and then i mixed in a couple pounds of uh, austrian field pea and so uh, just a little bit of hairy vetch for that nitrogen and uh, we're going to put that down here figure while we got the mower out here moving mineral might as well hook up the spreader and uh, what we're coming on to here paddock seven got a little bit of growth out here this isn't looking too too bad i'm tickled Pink, to be honest, to still be grazing here uh, on the 20th of October. Everything's still green. We really have yet to get our first real hard frost. Noticed a few patches here and there the other morning, but uh, the sorghum, the sorghum survived it. And uh, this is uh, this is looking. Got spots here where this is uh, almost. About knee high so uh you know it's spotty this time of year but uh certainly no need to mow out here the samer's gonna get old hank for us there there we go he just needs a little help want to uh
I want to talk just briefly about this mineral uh, program here. Let's walk over here and uh, have a look at this thing. So, so this morning was the first time I have actually noticed them in this thing other than to just itch. I uh, noticed the bulls will get on it and just itch. But uh, I noticed them this morning. They were especially, I noticed over in this corner, you can see, yeah, just look at the manure load. That'll tell you. Uh, over here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they've been into this uh, pretty good. They're even seeing some wood there uh, in the middle. Um, looking at some of this. Oh, yeah, that iodine. They've been hitting the iodine. Um, yeah, so, you know, I was a little bit worried there, especially on that magnesium. You know, we dealt with that grass tetany issue. Uh, so I've been last year. And, uh, okay, there they've... Uh, hit that to the wood they've hit the uh the v4 there the salt they've hit and uh cl been hitting some cl so yeah they're getting it they're getting what they need uh let's get this thing moved so the goal here with the uh cereal rye with the winter wheat and uh the vetch and the Austrian peas, uh, just to get a cover crop in here, get a little something else in here uh, while this perennial pasture is dormant. Looking ahead, this really should be seeded about a month before first frost, but looking ahead, I'll tell you, uh, especially with this El Nino uh, weather pattern, I'm wondering if uh, yeah, like next week's supposed to be have a day in the, uh, 70 degrees. You know, can we really get this established this late uh, in the season what we're already supposedly supposed to have had our first frost really haven't yet but can we get this seeded and then you know I'm wondering uh, with that type of seeding rate about uh, almost 120 pounds an acre uh, again this is a quarter acre but with doing that rate could we possibly have something green in the pasture here that comes on that we could do a little grazing on very very early in the season again you know mid-march right when there's nothing else out here is this something we could put those those uh pregnant ewes on uh you know really to uh you know to graze this then uh come march so we're gonna have uh, an additional living root in the soil over the winter uh, and then have that uh potential uh grazing uh, opportunity there in the spring just kind of how we're thinking and uh, the reason uh, I'm putting this out now. So when I make these videos, uh, most of the time I try and think back, and I think back to things that we've done, mistakes that we've made. What would we have done differently? And how could I pass that info along? And I think in doing so, you know, I'm hopeful that that creates value, more value in the content than just me coming out here and saying, oh, hey, you know, here's what we do. Uh, but giving the reasons why we did what we did, and what we would do differently now and, and why, you know, why that is. The number one thing that I wish we would have done as a grass-fed cattle and sheep producer, I wish we would have gone with the free choice mineral uh, to start out. And you know, the funny thing is, you could have told me that up front, but I don't think I would have listened. You know, I had to go through, and that's so many times that's how it is out here, right? It's like, well, you know, I'm not spending, a uh, thousand bucks for mineral and for a feeder, you know, when I can buy it for, uh, you know, 40, 60 bucks a bag, a 50 pound bag and just put it out as I need it, right? It's tough to justify that, uh, that initial cost. And also just the theory behind this, like really, you know, are my animals really going to get, uh, you know, like magnesium to, to uh, ward off a potential grass tetany issue? Are they really going to get what they need? But I think uh, in looking back, and you guys that know, have been following for a while, know our story. You know, we had an issue with grass tetany, lost a heifer. Grass tetany is a magnesium deficiency. Grass gets green and lush. Uh, your potassium levels go way up in that equation, potassium over magnesium plus calcium. Um, you know, it's all related. And uh, so we, we sent a sample in and found out that we were tetany, had, did have tetany prone pastures. It was around this time of year last year and more early September after Labor Day had a bunch of rain grass greened up looks a lot like it does now 
Um, and then we dealt with that issue. Just absolutely heartbreaking. First calf that had dropped here uh, ended up losing her, you know. And uh, yeah, it was a rookie mistake. Uh, we we lived and learned. Uh, but I think you know, coming through an experience like that really uh, taught me that hey, you know, you need to focus in on some of the the details here. Uh, and really fine tune and hone those. And I think one of those has been uh, this free choice mineral, you know, putting that out. You guys know I would do things a lot differently. I'm gonna do things a lot differently. We're gonna use this heavy feeder here and put that in our uh, our winter, our overwintering paddock, uh, where we keep cattle and feed out our hay, automatic water, buried water lines, so we don't have to deal with water uh, in the winter time. So my goal is for next spring, uh, especially, uh, you know, one of the main reasons, uh, having some something we can pull by hand, but also, you know, something like this, uh, we can run for sheep and cattle. Uh, and it was a little, uh, a little nerve wracking to put this out, right? And realize, okay, there's enough copper in there to probably uh, kill my whole flock and, uh, you know, uh, the, the next three or four flocks as well. A lot of copper. Uh, but you know what? That's the, that's the theory is that they're just going to get what they need uh, when it's individualized mineral. They're not going to, you know, versus uh, uh, like a for trail sheep Nutribalancer, what we were using. And, you know, we still do use that, you know, like when I've got the rams peeled off, I'll put a little bit of that over there. Um, but my goal is to, to have feeders that we can pull around the pasture here uh, uh, by hand, you know, not having to bring a equipment out here to move this thing uh, every time. And then the animals self-selecting for what they're deficient in. And over time, what really excites me is over time, your animals are doing the work for you. You know, your animals are doing the fertilizing. Uh, you know, these minerals that they're deficient in, you're, you most likely your pastures are deficient in those as well. And so you're seeing that mineral cycled through out into the urine, out into the manure, and then over time, you need uh, less and less of that free choice mineral. Uh, you know, it's something like a Fertrell sheep Nutribalancer or, or a cattle uh, Nutribalancer, beef Nutribalancer. We've used both those. They're good products. Don't get me wrong. Could we have warded off a grass tetany issue with the beef Nutri? I, I think we could have, even though it's only, I think, 3% magnesium. We were mixing equal parts weight, Redmond salt and organic kelp. Uh, and if you if you analyze that, if you look into that, virtually no magnesium in that mix. And so, uh, you know, the theory of cattle getting what they need or, or even my sheep, you know, we're in a selenium deficient area here. The sheep Nutribalancer has selenium in it. But in order for them to get selenium, you know, they have to get in there and they have to consume salt, you know, and they have to consume, uh, you know, whatever else is mixed in there in that mix to get to what they need and by consuming that other stuff then you know now other things are off balance um I, this is this is working out here uh this is working out and so uh you know looking looking back uh if i could talk to myself uh, seven years ago uh i would uh most certainly uh uh have a word and, and say hey and just just pay it get it in and use it Okay, just a quick shot of the sheep, uh, the ewes back here uh, on the swale. You guys that have been following along know, uh, took a little bit more of a risk this year with drought and put them back here in the middle of the hay field uh, down through this swale. I uh, apologize for the wind here. It is very, very windy back here, but you can see where we've come all the way down with this netting. And this is about the seventh, seventh or eighth move here, and we're all the way to the end. And so uh, we made it all the way down. We got a little bit that we need to finish trimming there that they uh, left behind. That's kind of how it looks when they're done. A few scragglers here and there that we kind of you know, zip off with the weed eater tool. Um, but uh, I'm just, I am just floored at uh, how good this looks. I'm floored at their body condition, how good their body condition looks uh, this time of year. Uh, it's just perfect, you know. Uh, going into breeding season here you know third third cutting on the hay field uh, has has been completed and so there won't be another cutting till the spring uh, so that gives us a little leeway to be back here um, you know the, the weather typically uh, in this area uh, you know August September beginning of October typically is dry 
Uh, and so, you know, we wouldn't want to be back here with them electrified and, and tightened in that, uh, trapped in that netting and have a big storm and a bunch of rain. So the dry season kind of works to our advantage this time of year. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm tickled pink uh, with this result. I got to bring the chainsaw back and trim up some scraggler trees. And we've been here seven years and really have never done much to this swale. And that, you know, that's been a mistake. It needs to be uh, knocked back. Otherwise, you're going to have that succession of trees and shrubs and everything else. Yeah, I mean, you'll get a forest, uh, actually. <laughs> That's what will happen. You know, you'll, you'll get the forest. And what's amazing is you can look back to where we started uh, about a month ago, and it's already greened back up, you know, down, way down uh, where we started. So pretty cool. Uh, this has worked out, worked out great. I had one last thing I wanted to talk about here, uh, one useful uh, trick or tool I came across uh, here recently, and that is on cattle weights. You know, cattle weights can be tricky, especially when you get into bigger animals, uh, bigger cow, or even our bull here. I've oftentimes wondered uh, just what our bull weighs. Knowing the weights of your animals can be useful if you need to dose for medication or, uh, you know, just when knowing when uh, to process and how, how big they're going to be. And uh, I thought, you know what, that would be really cool. I came across a, a formula. You can actually use iPhone. iPhone has a measuring tool. I'm sure you can do it on Android somehow as well. But uh, I, uh, I thought, you know what, we could actually check uh, to see if this works out with the weight of our calf here. He's doing great, by the way. Just hit two months old here uh, recently, and we put him on the scale. I thought, you know what, let's, let's go over this formula and these measuring tools that you can use iPhone for, and then let's compare that to what the actual weight is. Let's see how accurate this is. So in order to be able to do this, uh, you need to be able to get two main measurements. Let's just call those measurements X and Y. Uh, for this formula, you're gonna need an X, a Y, and a Z. But basically for X, uh, you're gonna go from the top of the shoulder uh, down to the bottom of the belly. Here, I'll, I'll put uh, Hank's measurements up here. He was right on about 21 and a half on that measurement. And that measurement is X again. And then you're gonna to wanna to go to a Y measurement. And the Y measurement is from the front of the shoulder blade to the back of the tail, the top of the tail. And for that measurement on Hank, he was 31 and a half. So, and then for measurement Z, what you're gonna do is just take measurement X times two. And so basically here, uh, what we're going to have, and I'll just go ahead and throw up this formula here. I'll put everything uh, that I talked about up here, and uh, it can be kind of confusing in the beginning, but basically, you know, we've got that X measurement, top, top of the shoulder to bottom of the belly. We've got the Y measurement, front of the shoulder to the top of the tail. And now to get Z, uh, we're going to double, double X, okay? And then for that formula, you can see there, it's gonna be Z times Z times Y, or Z squared times Y. And that whole thing divided by 300. And that's gonna give you your cattle weight. So the formula ended up giving us about 196 pounds. Uh, Hank actually weighed in at right around 185. So about, uh, it was about 11, 11 pounds too heavy. Anyhow, just another tool uh, in the uh, grazer's uh, tool belt here to quickly estimate uh, weights uh, on your animals and uh, come fairly close. So hope that helps you today. Uh, thanks for hanging with me today. Uh, be blessed today, uh, be at peace and uh, stay warm. We'll talk to you next time. Take care.